Good morning. Good morning. It's 10 o'clock. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone in the Cherokee room and those viewing the session remotely on YouTube or when you're recorded and you're seeing the rebroadcast. So thank you for being part of this meeting. Uh, for those in the room, uh, please mute your cell phones. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll try to keep this meeting to an hour. So please hold all of your questions till the very end. Now, for those that are watching on the YouTube channel, in the future, we'll have someone monitoring the chat room and you'll be able to answer questions or ask questions in, in future meetings. But unfortunately today, we're not prepared to do that. And I'm also pleased to announce that we're gonna have our first chat with the board since COVID. And we're gonna do that in either April or May. And we'll do an e-blast and communicate it in the Friday flyer. So if those of you that might not be familiar, it's something that was instituted a few years ago where members of the board will, will sit behind a table and we'll have breakfast in Danish and you can chat with us like it's an informal conversation. So we're looking forward to getting that working again. Okay, what I'd like to do is start the meeting now. If we could start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Anyone wearing a hat, please take it off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and self. Okay. Robert, if you could put the slide up for the agenda. Okay. All right. So the here are the topics that we're we're going to talk about today. And again, if you could just hold your questions to the end, we would uh, appreciate it. So a quick update on what we're calling or what we had previously called the Taylor property. If you could go to the next one, Robert. Okay. So yesterday we did close on the property. So it is officially now 20.92 acres of, of property that is part of Conesty. Uh, the total price came to be 313,800 plus legal fees and due diligence costs associated with, with the lawyers. And again, we listened to everyone and their desire that we, we go the extra steps and, and do the proper or, well, went a pretty deep dive on the on the due diligence. And as we've stated previously, we have no immediate plans for that property. The trail builders are contemplating developing or completing the Okinawa Trail. And so we have nice community access. As those of you that walk the property may know, there is a, a hunter's tree stand in there that will be dismantled and taken away. And we will put up no hunting signs on the perimeter with common, common properties. And we'll, we're also looking into improving the parking area up by the water tower, not only the Carolina water park, but perhaps we can put in some parking up there as well to make it much easier for people in the community to take advantage of that property. Okay. Uh, we're going to do a... Okay. The general manager report. So, Jim. 
Thanks, Brent. Go ahead. So we'll start off with a sort of a community and clubhouse uh, update. Um, hopefully you've all seen the barn expansion, which is completed now over there by the dog park. That building is getting uh, quite a bit of use already. Many of the groups and clubs are using it. So uh, we're excited that that is available for them. Um, one of the big things that has been great for us, as you'll notice, whether you go in Cherokee or in here or Carolina, you don't see a lot of stuff hanging around as much. We have a huge area behind us here now that is uh, completed for the Cherokee room storage. Um, so we've been taking advantage of that and organizing that the last couple of weeks. Uh, the lobby restrooms uh, were re renovated. Uh, they are complete as well. Uh, we had about, I can't remember, Lance, how many was it? Eight or 10 uh, clouded windows throughout the, the clubhouse. Uh, those have all been replaced. Uh, so we don't have the cloudy windows when you're looking out the great views that we have here in the clubhouse. Uh, one thing we're still waiting on is uh, down to grill. There's two doors, the door that goes by the kitchen and then the door that uh, enters from outside into the grill that are both rotted out from the bottom. So we are replacing those. I think April 18th is a date for those to be replaced. And we are replacing the single door that goes into the grill with a double door since that door is used quite, a, quite often. So that will happen sometime in mid-April. Um, we've been working with um, Hope at uh, New Leaf there in Etowah uh, to do a landscape design on both the main gate and the East Fork gate. Uh, I've met a few times with the um, uh, volunteer landscape groups on both those gates, and uh, we're hoping to potentially have those uh, replaced with new materials uh, next week, but she has not gotten back to me on a date yet, but she will oversee those installs um, and then the uh, regular uh, group flower groups and so forth will help maintain them going forward after their install. Um, the tennis area, I don't know if we have any tennis players here today, but we've been having, we're on our third pour now for the concrete and the social area down by tennis. Um, the last pour wasn't bad, but it wasn't great either. We're still getting some pooling in areas that we didn't like. Uh, so they are supposed to be back today uh, around, well, actually about time of this meeting, around 10 o'clock, they said they'd be back to do the last pour again. Um, we did add an additional drain as well. So we're hoping that this the third time will be a charm for that. Uh, next slide, please, Robert. Um, the interior walking track regrading, we completed that. That's all been uh, re regraded and seeded. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, uh, that will all be new grass area. Uh, we are, some of you who live on the lake, especially Lake Taco, may be aware we have a destructive beaver within the community. Uh, if that's done considerable damage throughout uh, the berm area, especially around Lake Tacoa. Uh, there were two of the beavers last fall. Uh, we didn't catch one of the beavers uh, in the right before winter last year, but there's still one individual and that we have been able to narrow down, we think, to where we found his den, but he is a very clever beaver. So we'll have to see how it plays out. <laughs> um, uh, Chef Andrew uh, continues to introduce new menus and we're getting positive feedback on what he's been uh, doing and providing for the food and beverage operation. Uh, we're doing pretty well in the front of the house as far as staffing, but in the back kitchen, uh, we are still short staff, but we're actively recruiting. Uh, the good news on that is January and February, our F&B sales were actually better than the pre-COVID 2019, January and February, which is when the new clubhouse opened. So uh, we're doing more business now than we did when the initially when the clubhouse renovation was complete, which was a record year originally before 2019. So uh, so hopefully that's telling us that we're doing some good things uh, and people are coming out and supporting it as well. And Mary and Lance are in the back of the room, so I'd like to thank them for what they do to to make those improvements. And uh, I, they continue to add things to the social calendar and different events. So uh, your support of those is greatly appreciated. Uh, the other good news is that the golf course uh, plays at record levels again for January and February. And anyone who lives here year round knows that January and most of February were not the most conducive to great weather. Uh, we didn't have a lot of rain, which is a good thing, but it was pretty cold. But even with the cooler temperatures, we had record play for both months. Um, and I think right now for this time of year, the golf course is the best shape I've ever seen it in the middle of the winter time or coming out of winter. So I want to thank Tom uh, and his crew for what they're doing on the golf course. From a connectivity standpoint, we always keep this on our agenda. Probably the number one question I get asked 
when people see me or emailed is, when are we going to improve our cell service? And right now the answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, there is still no progress on a cell tower. Um, you know, right now, if you pay attention a little bit to the local news, what's happening is there, it's actually going reverse. Uh, T-Mobile and Verizon have actually removed uh, some of their equipment, especially the tower that's located in Penrose. Um, so like me, I have Verizon, which was pretty good a couple of years ago. My Verizon signal is not near as good today within Conacy as it was a year ago or two years ago. So, you know, with the demographics and a number of people who live in the area, it's just going to be a tough challenge for anyone to convince the, uh, the providers to continue to invest funds. There was a, um, a deal at one point with AT&T and, and Cedar Mountain Fire. They were going to, AT&T was going to put a tower to help EMT service in that area. And ATT backed out of that deal as well. So that tower is not going in uh, either. So um, but what we are doing, and Robert and Zach in, in the back of the room, well, actually not Zach, he must have left. He's probably helping on maintenance, I mean, on construction. But um, we continue to add and improve our Wi-Fi spots throughout the community. So we'll continue to do that where we add them and uh, improve. I know the latest addition is um, they put another extender at Adagahi. So the Wi-Fi signal there now pretty much carries all the way out uh, to the dock pretty much. Um, so um, before, you, once you got down to that lower parking lot across from the beach, you pretty much lost signal, but now you will get a Wi-Fi signal pretty much all the way to the dock. So and then we all also improved it down by the um, organic gardens and dog park and new barn when we, uh, when we put the barn up as well. Uh, from a security pr perspective, um, our highest number of complaints are still the same two, uh, which are the lights being left on after 11, and obviously construction noise, because we have quite a bit of more construction than we normally do. Historically, we've only had maybe 10 to 12 units being built at any given time. Uh, right now, we have about 26 units that are, you know, new homes that are under some type of construction, and we probably have another 15 or 20 that are what I'd call under, you know, major renovation. So, um, so what's happened there is they start a little earlier than they're supposed to, and they, they continue working later than they're supposed to. So um, the good news is right now we do have a full uh, staff in security. So we do have a roving patrol uh, out there all the time. So if we get those calls, normally we can get out and uh, deal with those complaints in a relatively timely manner. Uh, the other one is an unfortunate one. Um, this is continuing to increase, is helping lost and or confused members to get home. So right now, you know, we're aware of, a, you know, probably six or eight at least of um, people that are really struggling. And unfortunately, um, you know, the spouses can't watch them all 24 seven. And, you know, they turn their head for 10 minutes or go to the bathroom for five minutes. And next thing you know, someone's out, out and about. So um, luckily what's really good is our, our guys, our guys and girls in security are good. Um, most of them, for whatever reason, remember who the person is and they, they remember them too. So they're comfortable getting in the patrol unit with them and letting them get him home. And they're, they're thankful for it because a lot of times, sometimes people are afraid of that, which would cause a whole nother problem. But luckily, so far, we've been able to handle it internally without having to get anyone else involved. Um, since the last meeting, our last quarterly meeting three, three or four months ago, uh, again, there has been no reports that we're aware of any of any serious crimes that have been issued. Um, Mike West is uh, in direct contact with uh, the sheriff. He knows many people within the county sheriff's department, uh, which is very helpful. So if they're aware of anything that's going on, they usually let us know. Uh, and we have not heard anything uh, lately, which is great. Uh, from a financial position, Obviously, only two months into the year, but we are $27,223 better than budget year to date. Um, so we are satisfied that we're handling things pretty good. We are seeing a, lack of a better word, a flatlining of cost increases. Uh, we're not seeing as much um, on reorders of getting hit for more and more increases. So it is leveling off. Um, and we are starting to get you know, a little better uh, response time on orders. So um, that's going good. On the activity and wellness, which is the last one I'll talk about, 
uh, the construction project. Just to give you sort of a reminder of where we were, uh, you all approved the project in September of 2022, at which time we then directed the architect to begin finalizing the, the construction documents so we could uh, continue on the project. In October of 2022, all the site work uh, began uh, with our crew. Uh, November of 2022, we sent out bid packages to four general contractors to bid on the project. And in January, those uh, those packages were reviewed and we interviewed. Um, basically, at that point, out of the four, only two submitted uh, packages. So we interviewed both of those general contractors. And then in February 2023, uh, we uh, awarded the contract to Appalachian Construction, uh, who's a general contractor who did the original um, clubhouse renovation a couple of years ago and has been doing all these smaller projects for us as well. Oh, the other project I forgot about talk about was the project over here by the kitchen where we improved that kitchen delivery area, which I think looks great. Um, but anyway, we've done a lot of business with them. They did the barn as well. Um, and right now we're moving much quicker than I thought we'd be doing as we started going vertical. Uh, so next slide, Lee Robert. So in March of 2023, uh, again, we, Spencer and his crew finished the final site work and we were just awaiting the county permitting, which we got approved. Um, and then again, just starting this month, uh, foundation and vertical construction began, which actually didn't start till March 10th. So we're talking 18 days, 19 days ago. And in that 19 days, you can see the progress that we've already uh, got to. Uh, we sent out the first video, uh, progress video last week. Uh, we're working on another one uh, currently. I'm not sure we'll get it out this week or not, but if not, we'll get one out next week. Um, and I think you'll enjoy those as we go along the project and we'll continue to send those out on a regular basis as progress proceeds. And according to our normal, our original schedule of 10 to 14 months, we anticipate March, April of 2024 for the project to be complete. And that's all um, all my presentation, Brent. So are you handling the next one? <laughs> Where's Donna? It'll take me a while, but I got it. All right. Did Brent give you the slide that he did, that he created? If not, it'll be on. Yeah, yeah it'll, be, it'll, be for, it'll be in front of you here. Well, I think he did a little different format. Oh, yeah, he gave it to me. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Robert. So I'm Donna Aiken Colflesh. I'm a new board member this year, and I'm the liaison to Facilities Planning Committee and also to the Build Out Task Force that we're going to talk about here. So the Community Growth Management Plan came out of the 2022 strategic plan that was approved by the board last summer. And you can see the charge here. Um, the team was charged to do a comprehensive cross-functional study. And what we're looking at is developing a total range targeted number of homes for Conesty Falls at what we consider full build out, whenever that might be. So we're probably looking at 18 to 20 years down the road. Over the last few years, we've been playing with a number of about 1,800, but we wanted to take a step back from that and look at legal ramifications, the impact on our amenities, uh, the impact on our quality of life, and what our members are telling us they want in terms of home density within Conesty Falls. So the team includes representatives from almost all of the permanent committees. I'm mislisting the judicial committee up here, which I apologize for, but we have we have uh, Marty Hodgkins from Facilities Planning, who's a former board member. We have um, Marty Oliver from Finance, we have Carl Terrell from A&E, we have Graham Smith from Natural Resources. Um, let's go back. Um, we have Jackie Pollock from Strategic Planning, we have Tom Colleton from Judicial, and the team is led by Dave Hunter, who's a former board member and president, president of the board. And like I said, I'm the liaison to that team. We have spent, we started meeting in October. Um, we're meeting about twice a month right now. We have looked at in the first quarter of the year, a, what I call a boatload of documentation. We've reviewed the facilities master plan, the comprehensive master plan, 
the capital improvement plan, the the all of the survey results dating back to 2014, the community benchmarking that was done in 2018. Um, we've looked at the 10-year financial projections. We also have Jim Mongaro on our team as a com community member at large and former treasurer of the board. Um, we've looked at, we have what we call, pardon me, the big badass spreadsheet of all of the lots either owned by the association or privately owned in Conestee Falls that might be available for sale, whether they're considered buildable or not buildable. And based on current assessments, I mean, we have, you know, assessments that were done in 2016, 2015 that, but what's buildable changes from year to year, depending on the building codes and how much people, how much money people are willing to invest in building that house on a cliff. Um, so we, you know, we've we've looked at a lot of information and continue to analyze on an ongoing basis. The other thing we kicked off um, this month was we decided to survey private lot owners within Conestee Falls, so owners of unimproved lots. Um, so we crafted a survey, kind of saying, okay, how did you acquire your lot? Um, what's your intention? What do you think you'll do with that lot? Do you plan to just keep it as an investment? Did you just inherit it and, and it's just sitting there because it's part of an estate? Do you think you build on it? And, and if you think you're going to build on it, when might you build on it? Um, and I forget how many, how many people did that? It went, we got 71 back. How many, what was it? We sent out about 250. So we got about 71 responses back. Um, and that survey just closed this week, and we're just starting to look at that data. So the point is, we're looking at a lot of information from a lot of different perspectives. We're doing some legal research um, into what what can, might, should be done in terms of where do we want to be in 18 to 20 years, and what can we do legally? What's you know what policy changes might be needed? That sort of thing. Go ahead, Robert. So some key premises that the teams are working on that we got out of reviewing all of this documentation. First and foremost, Conestee Falls is not and does not want to be a resort community. We have heard that clearly from our members. Our members tell us that they've moved here for the natural beauty, the proximity to Brevard, the quality of life that we have here in Conestee Falls. We don't want to become a resort community. We hear that loud and clear. And we are keeping that at the forefront of every one of our discussions when the team gets together. Natural beauty of Conestee Falls and the connection to nature is the key driver for member satisfaction, the key driver in all of our decision-making. The other thing members have told us very clearly in surveys over the years is our amenity set is very robust. And it includes just about everything people want in terms of amenities. And it's in keeping with the natural beauty of Conestee Falls. And that many people have clearly told us the future investment should be focusing on improving our existing amenities. For example, building a new activity and wellness center is improving on an existing amenity, but we should not be focusing on developing new, what we call attractions. So, for example, we don't want the water park on Lake Atagahi. We don't want the tiki bar that I have been trying to get for years. I'm just kidding. It's a private joke. Um, but anyway, so, so again, these are the things that the team, the build-out task force, is keeping at the forefront as we go through our process and, and start to develop a list of recommendations for the board. Next steps. We're going to analyze those uh, private lot owner results that we just got to see if there's anything new that might come out of that in terms of that might impact any assumptions we're making. We also have the 2020, it would be the 2022 um, new buyer results. So what you might not know is on an annual basis in January, there's a survey that goes out to anyone who has bought a lot or a home in Conestee Falls the previous year. We just got those results back from the company that did that survey. So we're going to be taking a look at that. And we're also going to complete our legal research. Um, we're looking at things like, can anything be done with lots that have tax liens against them? You know, if they're buildable, do we want to try to, to 
acquire them back for the association so that they're owned by the association and we could perhaps impact future development on those lots or turn them into green space or whatever the right answer might be. We were kind of hoping this is an official, but we're kind of hoping that we can wrap up our effort sometime in the third quarter of this year and give the board um, a tool set to, to help with future decision making um, when we look ahead to the future development within Conesty Falls. And I can tell you the number won't be more than 1800 when we come to total build up because none of us wants that. So any questions? Questions at the end. Questions at the end. My, I'm sorry. I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> Who's up next? Oh, rules are right. Rules are right. Brian. Brian O'Neill. Thanks. It'll be right in front of you. All right. Uh, the Rules and Regulations Task Force was approved uh, back in October. Uh, we started meeting in January. Uh, on the rules and regulations uh, task force, we're starting off with A and E rules. That is the largest uh, portion of the A and E regulations. Um, the total A and E regulations is about sixty pages worth of stuff in the governing documents. Uh, half of those are A and E related. Uh, it's a very very large job with that. It covers everything that has to do with the exterior of your home, uh, permitting for new construction. Uh, home improvements, uh, anything, landscaping, the whole nine yards with that. Uh, the entire project uh, covers everything with the use of the lakes, the clubhouse, the wellness center. Um, all of that is encompassed in the rules and regulations. On the committee right now, we have representatives from strategic planning, A&E committee, judicial, facilities planning, uh, FireWise, and myself as liaison to the committee. We're about two thirds of the way through uh, the A&E uh, revisions. We've just hit a point now where we're incorporating FireWise uh, recommendations into the A&E uh, rules. Uh, it's interesting because there are quite a few conflicts between what FireWise recommends and what we traditionally have recommended uh, in building in the home improvement uh, rules and regulations. So it's uh, interesting trying to get those two things to mesh. Uh, as we go along, uh, I'm hoping that we will be done with the entire review uh, sometime around uh, between August and the end of the year. Uh, as we go into other areas of uh, review. We will pull people in from different groups. Uh, for instance, we'll have golf uh, committee members come in when we're doing the golf rules and the same thing for tennis and bocce and some of the other uh, rules and regulations. We'll sit down with security when we go over those sections of the rules. So it's going to be very comprehensive. We're trying to eliminate any conflicts that are in the rules and regulations, old outdated um, provisions that are in there uh, and trying to make sure that it is something that's easy to use. It's sensible uh, things that don't get uh, followed through on, uh, try to remove those or change them to where they are, make sense to the members of the community. And that's about it. Just one additional comment on the rules and regs. Before anything gets approved and, and finalized, obviously it's got to get out to the community for vetting. And I believe in that case, we also have to have a vote. One or is it just so vetting? The rules I think the board can yeah. do it both face yeah. on this input. Right. But when it gets to some of the govern other governing documents, that if, if so, changes are in that one, that one does require community vote after the feedback. So You'll have an opportunity to review what comes out of that 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 task force, which I think is going to be good stuff for the community as we go forward for generations to come. 
Okay. Yeah, we complete rules. Well, 50 years, right? Well, the last revision of the rules uh, was 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So a quick update on the pool enhancement project. Uh, we're trying really hard. Chip and Jim can certainly attest to that to try to get these renderings and a cost estimate from our, our GC for the project. So we're, we've been saying it for probably over a year now. We've been waiting for good renderings and we keep getting told that you'll be getting them soon. You'll be getting them soon, but we need those renderings first. Um, I thought the other contracts got nobody. In. Yeah, no one else is interested in that job at this point. So that's one of the unfortunate things of living in in a rural setting where you don't have a lot of competition and a lot of contractors. So it it makes it a little bit harder and more frustrating for us to try to get this thing moving forward. But the thought would still be to enlarge the the pool with multiple lap lanes. You know, we're still considering a separate covered pool to allow exercise and swimming throughout the year, but still experience a, a good a good time in the summer by being able to pick up the sides of that that structure and open it up almost like it's open air, but you're still covered. Still thinking, well, we need a new pool house, no matter what, that pool house needs to be replaced. It's it's used by the pool, it's used by pickleball, it's used by bocce. Uh, and we need to have a better way of controlling access into that area. So when we redo the, the pool house, that will also be, is being planned to be the entrance into that, that space. And we're looking at using RFID to restrict access into that area. So we, we know who's in there, when they're in there, and that they're authorized to be in there. And like right now, if you, you give somebody the code to the gate, they can come in. Once they're inside the community, anybody can come in. So what we're hoping is that as I just said, that we get the design and we get a cost estimate. And as soon as we get that, we will hold a, a public session where we can vet what that design looks like, what the costs are, then follow that up with a, a Q&A session with the community and then move forward with a community vote. And that'll take 30 days to allow the vote. We're pretty good with counting the vote. So that's what we have. You know, we're, like I said, we're at we're being held hostage by the, the contract. Hostage might not be the right word, but we can't move forward until we get some information from our one contractor. Okay. Natural resources, we're gonna have Janet and Roger and Graham are here as well. Hi, I'm Janet Saucier. Um, I'm the board liaison to the Natural Resources Stewardship Committee, and I just want to, before introducing Graham Smith, um, the chair of the committee, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about why, why does this committee exist and so forth. So um, back in 2020, the board decided that preserving and sustaining, addressing our natural beauty, our natural environment. There goes my papers. <laughs> At least it's not a deck of cards. Um, so we decided that this was an issue that was important to the community. And we developed a task force, a board task force called Care for Our Natural Environment it became one of the big five initiatives in 2020. Now, at the same time, the second big five initiative, which was build a Conestee Falls brand. Um, Robert, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So build a Conestee Falls brand also through that effort, we did some marketing research within the community and members made it very clear to us, they feel a very near connection to our natural environment. So, and as Donna also pointed out, other surveys of new home buyers and home buy, homeowners has also said, this is one of the primary reasons that people wanna live in Conestee. And it's part of our experience and quality of life, if you will. So it became increasingly clear that the care for our natural environment effort needed to become an ongoing 
operating strategy for the association. Robert, if you could change. Thank you. In November, 2021, the Natural Resources Stewardship Committee was chartered and the current members are Graham Smith, who is chairperson, very brave person to become chair of a brand new permanent committee. Uh, Dick Bennett, AJ Longwear, Mike Mack, Patty McGinnis, and Roger Whitmer. And as I mentioned, I am the liaison. Each of these folks has some background. And if you wanna go back, Robert, thank you. Did I hit that? I'm sorry if I did. Um, each of these people has some background and experience, whether it be in water quality or plant life, forestry, or in Dick Bennett's case, you may all know Dick as Mr. Conesty Falls. He served as the community liaison on A&E for many, many years. So it's a great group of people. They have a great synergy going. Um, and I wanted to introduce Graham to you. You may know him, you may not. So in the case that you don't, Graham and Jill, his wife moved here permanently five years ago, but you purchased a house here 10 years ago. Um, he was on the SPC for two years, the Strategic Planning Committee, helped with the first comprehensive master plan, has been involved with the strategic plan in past years during his, his time there. And he is a fly fisherman and he's an outdoors person. So he has a strong appreciation for the beauty that we have here. Um, he told me to also tell you that he's an all around good guy. <laughs> so I, I think he's trying to suck up right now so you don't make a heart out of him. So with that said, here's Graham Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet. Um, uh, you'll uh, soon figure out I, uh, I'm not from around here. I have a, an accent. And um, when uh, people find out I come from England, they automatically assume that I can write like Charles Dickens and give speeches like Winston Churchill. And that's not the case. So uh, if you can't hear me or if I start mumbling, then wave your hand uh, and shout at me, please. Um, well, the other thing that they also assume is that you lived in a castle when you were in England, and that's that's also not true. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? So when we formed the uh, the uh, the committee um, about uh, eighteen months ago, like all good committees, what we did was uh, talk about a mission statement and our our vision. And um, we did that, and um, when the uh, stewardship plan is is, um, is published, you'll you'll see those those things in the stewardship plan. But one of the things we also did was was to consider what the strategic principles might be for our natural resources committee. So we wrote down five things. So the, the first and the most important is to listen to the stakeholders and to uh, the different clubs and organizations and the people that, that live, live here. And so the, um, the survey results that I'm going to give you in a moment, they're really the result of, of that exercise. Um, the, the second strategic principle that, that would, we would uh, look for expertise from outside organizations. We have some very bright uh, and knowledgeable people here in Conesty Falls, but there are going to be instances where we'll need uh, help from outside. The third point is very, very uh, important. The decisions that the committee make will be data-driven and science-based. Uh, what I found out from being on this committee is that people feel very, very passionately about the environment and their natural resources, and everybody has an opinion, and some of those opinions are very strong. Um, and it's the same for all the people on the committee uh, as well. But we do feel that we should, that opinion should be in the background and the decisions of the committee should be data-driven and science-based. Um, the fourth principle is that we will generate, well, we will create a stewardship plan and we will generate support for it through communication and education. 
And the last point is that we will have educational programs to explain to people the beautiful uh, environment that we, we have here. So over the next slide, please. So you all may have seen this survey that came out uh, a few months ago, in October 2022. We sent out over 2,500 uh, uh, survey requests to uh, email addresses, and we got about a third of those back, 713 qualified surveys returned. And that gives us a margin of error of 3% um, for the general population. So um, it, what it means is that those 713 surveys should pretty accurately reflect what everybody uh, thinks uh, um, about our natural resources. So Robert, next slide, please. So um, the first question was, uh, do you agree that the natural environment is an important attribute of Conesty Falls? And a huge 98% of, uh, of people uh, agree with that. It's, it's the principal reason that, 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 or one of the principal reasons that, that, that people move here. Um, so the next slide, please. When you are in Conesty, how often do you appreciate your natural surroundings within Conesty? Every day. And uh, to me, that's a wonderful thing. I can, can wake up gloomy and go for a walk down the road and I come back refreshed. We live in a very, very beautiful place. Uh, next one, please. Um, uh, 95% agree that the, uh, the water quality of our lakes and streams is an important attribute of our natural environment. And when we're talking about water quality here, we're talking about the lakes and streams and not the water that comes out your, uh, your tap. That comes from the utility company. Um, next, please. Uh, a lot of people, 95% think that education is very important. I think that education can be, and educational programs can be good, not only for the, the, the benefit of the people who attend these programs, but also what it says about Conesty. And um, in terms of marketing our community, and being able to say that we have these education programs and that we, you can come here and learn about your natural resources and the environment, I think that's a really important thing. And maybe at some stage we'll have education programs for, for children in the summertime, I don't know. But education is a really, really big part of, of, uh, of our natural resource program. And next one, please. So this one is very contentious. Um, so the number one question I get asked when I tell people that I'm on the, uh, the natural resources committee is, well, what are you going to do about the deer? And, um, so that was one of the questions in, the, in the survey. And so, uh, about 15% replied, the deer are no personal concern to me. About 25% uh, said that the deer are a nuisance. And about 65% said that the deer are a part of what makes living here special. So these are opinions. And like I said uh, earlier, our um, committee decisions are gonna be based on data and science. But at least from this, we know overall what the general feeling is within the community uh, uh, about the deer. Um, I think it does turn out that the people who think the deer are, are a nuisance are also the people that come and talk to me because they, uh, they have a, a subject that they, they want to want to address. So my uh, perception of, of, uh, of the opinion out there may be different from the true perception, which is in this survey. And next one, please. So, and then... Uh, um, just move on and talk about, um, uh, if you like, the, the bottom line, if you want. How does all this affect our, our, our property values? And 96% of people agree that caring for our natural resources will positively impact property values. So that's very, that's very encouraging. So not only do we do good work and look after our environment here, but we're all going to get richer as well from it. So. 
Um, that's all I have to say on the, the survey. Uh, we will be publishing a summary of the results at some time in the, in the future. And uh, next, please. Um, oh, this is just a summary of what we uh, what I just said. Uh, there was one point at the bottom there. A lot of people took time to give us, um, if you like, custom comments uh, on the survey. There were lots of opportunities uh, where you could give your opinion about something rather than just answering yes or no. Uh, in fact, it was fantastic. We got almost uh, 700 uh, different comments from, from, from people. So that was really great. The three takeaways from that that we came up with were we should be keeping wildlife wild and stopping uh, a deer and bear habituation. We should be concerned about our forest health because the forest is a principal part of our environment. And we should also make sure that we have good water quality. And so next one, please. So uh, over the last year, um, uh, well, let me begin at the beginning. When the committee started, uh, the board had commissioned Equinox uh, Environmental out of uh, Asheville to do a, uh, an inventory of what we have here in uh, Conversity Falls and look at our natural resources and, and give us something that could be a baseline for planning going forward. And I think there are, it's something we don't have at the moment, or we didn't have. Uh, there were a lot of people that knew different things, but there was nothing ever written down that was in one place that you could go to and you could know what we have in, here in Commonwealth Falls. So that study began in 2021, covered four seasons, um, and it will be invaluable for developing our stewardship plan. Um, so next one, please. So the highlights of the, uh, the inventory, we've identified six different forest community types here. Um, one of the really interesting things is that, that Owen Carson, who's the guy that did the survey for us, found a Southern Appalachian bog here, which is a pretty rare type of environment. Um, it also turns out that they, these type of bogs have been around for a very long time. And typically they are very old on the, on the order of thousands of years old. So we have one, it's not very big, but we do have one and it's on some uh, unimproved lots that the POA owns. And um, we are taking steps to those lots will not be sold. And maybe at some point in the future, uh, those lots will be become part of a, uh, um, uh, uh, a small park, perhaps, or an interpretive display. We have to figure out what to do with that, but it will be protected. Uh, next, please. Uh, we have a habitat suitable for rare animals. So if you see one of these little babies, I want you to take a picture and send it to me. And that's a green salamander. It's uh, pretty rare. And um, Owen uh, Carson spent uh, many hours trying to find one here. They do exist in uh, nearby areas. So we're pretty certain they're here somewhere. We just haven't found them yet. And we also probably have spotted skunks that we uh, haven't found yet. And their, their claim to fame is that when they are going to spray you, they do a handstand and do it backwards. So if you see a skunk that's on the, standing on its front legs, you should get out of the way. Um, we, over on uh, Batson Creek, we have a microclimate that's favorable to yellow birch trees. They don't occur in very many places, but they do over there. And amazingly, we have 120,000 feet of streams which support all these, these animals down here. That's incredible. And obviously, some of these streams are very small, but just 120,000 linear feet of streams within uh, our environment here. We are at the headwaters of, of the French Broad, which obviously flows down, eventually ends up in the Mississippi. And so it's, uh, that's a very inspiring thought. And uh, next, please. Uh, we have some rare plant species, which uh, we already uh, uh, know about, have been found, and potential for others based on uh, their occurrence within nearby. Uh, on the negative side, we have um, 
some invasive plants and animal species that will need to be dealt with over the, the next few years. And the committee will be putting in place programs to address the invasive species. We've already seen, um, uh, we had a, groups of people working on the hemlock uh, woolly adelgid and uh, I know Lisa Smith has been done a fantastic job uh, uh, spearheading that, that initiative and Roger is, uh, as well. And the, uh, the natural resource inventory also contains maps of conesty and shows our relationship to the surrounding conservation areas. When that was really, really useful when we were talking about the Taylor property. And the next one, please. And so that, uh, to summarize, um, well, to bring the talk to an end, um, there are uh, a lot of educational opportunities coming up. Uh, I would really, really encourage people to come along and join some of these things. These uh, programs are led by experts who really know what they're talking about and they'll show you things you didn't know existed. If I had to pick one, I would pick the Blue Ghost Fireflies uh, Night Walk. If you haven't done that, if you stand out in the middle of the forest and it's dark at night in June, and you look for the little dots of light flashing around you, it is a magical experience. So I would really recommend that, that you do that if you have the time. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I forget what's next. Oh, oh are you yeah. Okay, the, the next quick topic that we'll talk about is that it's come to our attention and we have known it too for a while that a lot of there's quite a few vehicles in our RV parks. It's starting to look more like a, a junkyard than an RV park. So this past year, we introduced a procedure on the storage racks for watercraft, which tried to accomplish the same thing and getting the owners of these craft to, to take care of them. And if they're not going to take care of them, you know, something will have to get done about it. So again, we're trying to address and are addressing an issue that's been brought to our attention and bringing it to the forefront. So much like with the watercraft procedure that we put together a rental agreement, we're going to do a very similar thing with, with the RV parks. So we're going to do an, an initial or an inspection this summer, and then on an ongoing basis annually, we will continue to do it. Uh, if poorly maintained vehicles are identified, and that could also include unlicensed road vehicles or uninspected roadworthy vehicles, they'll be considered poorly maintained and we'll contact those, those owners to, to remediate that, that situation. And just like with uh, the watercraft, in, starting in 2024, we're going to get those renters to sign a new agreement and that they agree to the inspection and removal procedure. That would be on the reverse side of the form, just like with uh, the watercraft. Next slide, Robert, please. Okay. So as I, I mentioned, you know, inspection and removal, the key points, you know, the vehicles have to have a, a current state inspection if they're licensed. They must be maintained properly and operational. And if they're not, then the owner's got to either remove them or repair them. And if they're not willing to comply, then we'll get with judicial and, and we'll look at introducing some, some fines, just as in the, the watercraft. Okay. Next slide, Robert. So with that, you know, the, the formal portion of the meeting is now concluded. So question and answer period. If you have a question, I ask that you go to the microphone. If you don't use the mic, the folks that are on the YouTube channel cannot hear your question. So introduce yourself and, and ask your, your question. Any questions? I'm John Colflesh. Um, has any consideration been given to a, a central notification point like on the website for uh, areas where there are issues with wildlife, there are 
mother bear with cubs is sighted on this street, uh, this trail, somebody saw a copperhead, um, there's an outbreak or a, an infestation of uh, uh, yellow jackets in this area. So uh, one place other than next door where we could go to find out where we shouldn't be uh, hiking or walking. Yes or no, yeah, at this point, you know, I'm not aware of any formal way to communicate that, but it's something that we can certainly look at introducing now. We'd look to, to folks to help us with what that that might be, whether it's the... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one, um, we're, we're actively working on the new website as well, of upgrading the website, and one of the uh, functions of that website is they have what they call a alert bar that sort of scrolls um, right underneath the main page uh, where the picture is. Um, so that is something that we could use for those those specific type purposes. I'm, I'm trying to remember though, I think it's just one line that keeps repeating. So it's a loop, right? So if there, you know, for one instance, it's, it's easy, but if you had a yellow jacket here and a bear over there, I'm not, you know, we'd be limited on what we could put, but that I think would be a good, a good spot for something like that, especially if it's a, a, a spur of the moment type of thing where you could change because we can change it hourly or daily or weekly and update it quickly. Yeah. Period of time. So that's something we'll we'll put on the docket. Thank you, John. Any other questions? Lorraine work sixteen thirty seven. Um I know the meeting on this one was ten AM. I thought in the past it was usually three, ten AM 3 p.m. Yeah, it's, we've been moving the times around based on availability as some um, people's requests. Some people yeah. want it, some want yeah. it. Okay, so we I, I got a around. bunch of ladies at my house last night and they all wanted to come, but they golf and have gym in yeah. the morning. So yeah. they were a little shocked. Yeah. I don't think they read the time on the notice. So yeah. they were shocked that it wasn't three o'clock today and it had been moved yeah. to 10. I skipped yeah. golf so I could come, but yeah. I was a little concerned about the sudden yeah. shift to an earlier hour. Yeah, yeah it's not permanent. Now, now is this recorded so it is online because the notice didn't say that so that's why i came because i wasn't sure it was going to be recorded yeah. for review um, correct me from but correct me from but all the youtubes are available correct. once we edit again yeah. so, and that's an ongoing standard pr procedure anytime we have these meetings are going to be recorded and reviewable and going forward they're all they'll all be recorded and available on youtube And for those that may be new, it's a, a quarterly process that we have these meetings. We'll probably go, but try to go back to three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we would prefer what later in the afternoon. We can have people say four instead of three, so those that that work have a better opportunity to be here, even though they may be working from home. I mean, one one of the issues for this meeting is, and this is where we get into tricky part for this room because it's used for so many different things. Is like this afternoon, I. I'm not sure if it's cats or crow, but somebody's using it from three to five, like every day this week for rehearsal. So that, so, <laughs> oh yeah. And they're setting up for a wedding or something. So anyway, but we, we were going to try to keep it at the, the three to four o'clock like we used to, but we couldn't for this particular meeting. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I'd like to thank everyone for making us part of their day and being part of what part of this community which we all love to call home thank you